Trilobites sound like a tasty snack food, but they're actually one of the most successful animal groups to have ever existed. But what were trilobites? Where did they live? When did they live? And where did they all go? Let's find out together with the power of science and friendship. Friendians. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Brute Johnson and I'm a geologist who studies rocks that are billions of years old and the tiny wee fossils that we find in them. This channel is where I talk about geology, so if there's something you want me to talk about that's geology related, including fossils, rocks, minerals, then let me know in the comments below. You can find me on all the social medias as Geology Johnson, and the links to those and to these Proterozoic Park shirts are in the description below. On that note, subscribe, like, share, and all that stuff. With all that out of the way, let's crack on. Trilobites are one of the most well-known and loved fossil groups. I've been fascinated by them since I was a wee kid. <laughs> My actual size of me is a wee kid. Sadly, the rocks where I grew up were early Jurassic, so too young for trilobites, but they did have lots of beautifully preserved ammonites. I had a prehistoric animal book that was about life before the dinosaurs. It was pretty mind-blowing for me at the time that there were things older than my granddad. Older than dinosaurs was like, whew. This book had some lovely illustrations of trilobites and nautiloids and other Paleozoic creatures in it. I also had a single top trumps card with a Cambrian trilobite on it called Paradoxides, and I was low-key obsessed with it because it was like a photograph of a model, not a picture of a fossil, and I thought it was so cool. From these books, I learned that trilobites had gone extinct long before the Jurassic, and that if I wanted to find trilobites, I'd have to look in older sedimentary rocks. However, despite looking in places where trilobites are supposed to be abundant, I've still never actually managed to find any trilobites in the wild. Well, except when I visited the Burgess Shale, but that doesn't count because you're not allowed to take them away. Trilobites were marine invertebrates, and that means that they had an external skeleton with no internal bones and that they lived in the sea. That external skeleton was made of a mineral called calcite, which is a type of calcium carbonate. This is quite a geologically resistant material. It's one of the things that makes up limestone, which is why trilobite skeletons have such a good fossil record. Trilobite skeletons are split into three sections or lobes, lengthways, which is how they get their name, which means three lobes, with two of the side parts uh, around a central axis. You can also split them into three sections from front to back, the cephalon, which is where the head is, the thorax, which is the bit with all the segments and the legs, and the pygidium, which is the tail, informally, also known as the trilobut. <laughs> I mean, anatomically split them, you don't have to chop them up. You can if you want, I suppose. Who am I to tell you what to do with your fossils? The smallest trilobites were only a few millimetres long, while the biggest could be over a metre long. That's about this big for my American viewers. Most were only a few centimetres though, so about year big. Trilobites first appeared around 521 million years ago in the early Cambrian period. They were most diverse during the Ordovician period when they evolved into pretty much every available ecological niche. All of them, just everywhere. The beetles of the Paleozoic. After this, trilobites became progressively less diverse and abundant until eventually becoming extinct towards the end of the Permian period. This means that they were around as a group for about 270 million years, which is pretty good going for a critter that looks like an alien Roomba. Trilobites look a bit like modern woodlouse. And while trilobites are arthropods, the group of animals with segmented legs and external segmented skeletons, they are only very distantly related to woodlice. Woodlice are actually isopods, which are crustaceans, so they're more closely related to crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. Trilobites are currently thought to be their own group that left no modern descendants, which makes me sad because imagine having a cool little trilopet. The modern group most closely related to trilobites is probably the chelicerates, the group that includes arachnids and horseshoe crabs, which are not actually crabs. Like most arthropods, trilobites had a segmented body made up of mineralized plates. As I said, trilobite skeletal plates were made up of calcium carbonate, mostly calcite, and that was set in an organic matrix of chitin. Trilobite shell was more heavily mineralized than other arthropods, and this is one of the reasons that trilobites are so common and so well preserved compared to other arthropods. Having said that, I've still found more fossil crabs than I've found fossil trilobites, so. I won't go through all of the detailed different parts, but you can pause the video or follow the link to see the names in this handy diagram on this handy website about trilobites. Trilobites didn't have hands though. Trilobites had multi-lens compound eyes like other arthropods. We know this because unlike other arthropods, in trilobite eyes, each lens was a single crystal of calcium carbonate. So, you know, preserve really well. There's a few different types of trilobite eyes that we recognize. Holocrawl eyes are the most common type of trilobite eye and had calcite lenses. Skyzacrawl eyes are less common and they had high magnesium calcite lenses. Abathocrawl eyes, that sounds like the name of a cartoon villain. Abathocrawl eyes are the least common and they're only found in the early Cambrian Eodoscina trilobites. Some trilobites were blind 
Agnostic trilobites, which are wee small, were primarily blind, which means that they started out blind and they never developed eyes. Others, like Cryptolithus, started out with tiny eyes and then lost them, probably because they lived in environments where eyes weren't that useful, like the deep sea or in mud or in Milton Keynes. Other trilobites, like Opiputerella, that's another fun word to say, Opiputerella had huge eyes that went around most of their heads. This trilobite probably swam in the water column so needed to be able to see from all directions rather than just being sat on the seabed where it only needs to look in a few directions. Trilobites had a shield-shaped mouth part called the hyponome and that's found on the underside of the cephalon. Some hyponomes were separate from the cephalon where others were fixed at the edge. Trilobites had a pair of legs on each one of their segments of the bodies and these legs were biramus, which sounds like the name of a wizard, but it actually means the leg had two parts, a lower part for walking and manipulating things, and then an upper part, which was a gill. Trilobites probably laid eggs like other arthropods, but they did it first before it became popular. Trilobite eggs are pretty rare, but trilobibis are relatively more common. This means that we can build up a picture of their ontogeny, which is the process of how an organism changes from when it is born or when it hatches, all the way through to when it dies after living a long and happy and fulfilling life, or it gets eaten. Trilobites molted, which is what most trilobite fossils are, they're empty molts. Then the trilobite grew by adding extra segments at the back end. When a trilobite molted, normally the sutures on the cephalon, which are the lines where the armor plates on the front area fused together, would split apart, the trilobite scuttled out, that's what scuttling looks like, just if you needed a reminder, and then grew while the shell was still soft, very similar to how modern arthropods do it today. The style of suture splitting and molting pattern appears to have been quite varied among trilobites, with some showing variation even within the same species. We mentioned that trilobites have two types of hypostome. I might have said hyponome previously, but it's definitely hypostome. We mentioned that trilobites have two types of hypostome, attached and free. There are a lot of different types of hypostomes, and it's thought that the shape and attachment evolved from different feeding habits. For example, an attached fork hypostome might be good for rending the flesh of your hapless prey. Trilobite legs also featured little spines on the inside, which may have helped them feed by again, rending the flesh. In some rare cases, trilobite guts have been preserved, and we can see that the trilobites had a ate a variety of other creatures, including other trilobites. We also find fossil poo called coprolites and gut contents called collolites from other organisms, and it shows us that, that these creatures were eating trilobites as well. For example, this worm called a toya sometimes has trilobite parts preserved in its gut. Trilobites are occasionally found with damage that may be bite marks, though that's contested by some researchers. This damage sometimes shows signs of healing, which means that whatever was causing the original damage wasn't always fatal. One way that trilobites could escape from danger was by rolling up into a little ball like modern woodlice do. Although when the danger is a gigantic underwater avalanche, rolling into a ball is not really going to help you. But it does help you become preserved. As well as their bodies, we often find traces of trilobite behaviour. Cruziana is a trace fossil interpreted to show the burrowing of trilobites through the sediments searching for food. It's basically fossilised snuffling for truffles. One famous example is interpreted as showing a trilobite hunting for worms by sniffling around at their burrows. Maybe this was revenge for the ones that got eaten by a toya. Rusophycus is a trace fossil interpreted to show the resting trace of a trilobite, the place where it had a bit of a sit down after a busy day of trilob bustling around the ancient seabed. The scratch marks in these trace fossils are where the legs of the trilobite were digging in the sediment, but it's important to note that trace fossils like this could be produced by multiple different organisms. Let me know if you want a trace fossil video, because trace fossils are super cool and they don't get the attention that they deserve most of the time. From first appearing in the early Cambrian through to their peak in the early Ordovician, trilobites were a major component of marine ecosystems. Not sure why we specify marine, because it's not like there was much happening on land during the early Ordovician. Trilobites really took a heavy hit during the end Ordovician mass extinction, which was the second largest of the major mass extinctions. There were 61 families of trilobites in the early Ordovician, compared to the 19 families of trilobites that survived through into the early Silurian. Trilobites didn't really do much in the Silurian. They were around, you know, just getting by, not causing any problems. But in the Devonian, trilobites got really weird and spiky. These spectacular trilobites are from the Devonian of Morocco. I got to see them being prepped in the workshop where they're carefully extracted over hundreds of painstaking hours by very skilled preparators. Some researchers suggest that the evolution of super spiny trilobites in the Devonian was a response to the arrival and diversification of the jawed fishes. Some of the armoured arthrodire fishes in particular had powerful jaws and teeth, presumably for crunching through the armour and bone 
bones of other armoured fishes and they could probably make short work of a tiny trilobite shell. Or maybe the trilobites were just feeling fancy, who knows? Either way, all those spines didn't help the trilobites survive the Kalawasa and Hangenbergen events at the end of the Devonian. That's right, not one, but two major mass extinctions. Talk about a double whammy. The surviving trilobite families went into a long, slow, sad decline over the remainder of the Paleozoic. Kind of like when your favourite band loses their mojo and starts putting out really bad experimental albums. Only four families of trilobites survived into the Carboniferous and only two made it to the late Permian. Those last two families died out with 95% of all marine life in the end Permian mass extinction, also known as the Great Dying. That would be a sweet name for a death metal song. There's no single reason why trilobites went extinct. Each extinction event is a unique set of circumstances, as is the response of species that survive or die out during those events. There had already been a minor extinction in the Middle Permian, which had reduced trilobite diversity. So when the largest mass extinction in the history of life occurred, the already stressed trilobites were in the worst possible position to try and weather the storm, biologically speaking. Trilobites were immensely successful for 270 million years. Few other animals in Earth's history have been this successful. But if the history of life on Earth has taught us anything, it's that this planet is really good at killing things. And even the look of the most successful and adaptable organism runs out eventually. During their time, trilobites witnessed the appearance and extinction of many other animal groups, the rise and fall of whole mountain chains, the births and deaths of entire oceans and even the formation of a supercontinent. But eventually, like all other life on Earth, their time ran out and the trilobites passed into the long records of the Earth. Their story written in the rocks and then found and read millions of years later by the distant descendants of one of the creatures that the trilobites had shared the Earth with. So there you go, a very quick and brief introduction to one of the most famous and charismatic extinct creatures to inhabit this planet. I hope you enjoyed that and learned some new trilo facts. What's your favourite trilobite? And have you ever found any in the wild? Let me know in the comments below. Press the buttons to tell the machine overlords that you like this kind of thing. And until next time, thanks for watching, stay safe and have fun with your rocks. Latest potatoes. Did I make that joke in the last video? Who knows? Time is a construct. It's an illusion. Time is an illusion. You can find And the... The description below in the comments. Ooh. Hooray, did it. And with all that out of the way, let's crack on. With all that out of the way, let's crack on. ASMR banana style. Beautifully preserved ammonites. Yorkshire ammonites. The best kind of ammonites. I had a prehistoric trilobite in, 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 in. I was like, really, for my Yay, big. 500. The modern group mostly <laughs> or Eodiscina, Discina, Eodiscina. That's a cool word to say. Eodiscina, Eodiscina. Hello, I'm Byramus the Wizard. I have the magical ability to keep you in suspense. So they are very excited, tiny gnome. Hypersturm, 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 hypersturm. Rending the flesh of your hapless prey. Uh, they like to eat the babies. Tasty, tasty babies. As well as their bodies, we often find trilateral cross between a wolf and an estate agent.